first time I'm giving a public talk in English, so sorry for my grammar. Uh, I work at Findify, we do search for e-commerce, and we usually care about performance. But all the performance advices given in this talk are accidental, and if you uh, inspired by all the advices, rewrite all your codes with a while loops and uh, get rid of pattern matching and get fired for that after that, so I warned you. Um, but um, before that, uh, although you know that Scala is a kind of cool language, and among the switchers from other languages, uh, I s heard about a lot of success stories, like we rewrote our spaghetti-like Java code base in Scala, and it became three times shorter for the same functionality. But these success stories uh, can have some uh, drawbacks, like the code became three times uh, shorter, but also can become three times slower. And that's why, uh, that's what my talk is about. Uh, if you use all these functional cool things in your hot code path, it makes them uh, more readable, uh, more maintainable, and more understandable, but less predictable. Because you can implicitly create something new, ins instances of new objects, and uh, do some things you are not exactly aware of, but they are happening under the hood. And uh, the code you wrote with Scala can surprise the JVM sometimes. Uh, so uh, this, this talk is about s some theory about how the performance measurement usually happens, uh, and it's usually hard. Uh, um, what uh, happens with your code when you hit the compile button, it's, uh, and uh, the tools we you can use for measuring the performance of your code. Um, but it's not only the theory, we also will talk about some case stories about pattern matching, recursion, and uh, Scala collections, and at the end, some obvious things about general advices for the performance, and so on. Uh, but before that, the just a simple question. If, is, uh, I forget to start the timer. Uh, a simple question, is benchmarking is really hard. So we can just run, uh, type this type of code, have a timestamp here, a loop which measures, uh, runs our function a couple of times, and then just at a timestamp and get the performance. What's wrong with this code? Do, do anyone see the problems here? Ah, uh -huh, right. Uh, loop can be eliminated if there is no side effects. What's the reason of running this loop at all? So we just measure the difference between the timestamps. Uh, if it's not optimized by the uh, uh, by the GVM, if there is some side effects, it can be interpreted from uh, the first half of the iterations and uh, compiled at the second half of the iterations. So you measure half of the super slow function and half of performance of the super fast function. So the result will be not really representative. Um, the whole loop can take less than one millisecond. Why not? It can be super fast. Maybe you're just adding some integers here. And a lot of other pitfalls here uh, you may not even know about. Uh, because Hotspot GVM is quite smart, it's uh, not super smart, but it's smart enough to give you some tricks you are not aware of. Uh, so uh, usually when we hit the compile button, we imagine that we, if we have some our uh, color code, we hit the button, uh, here comes the compiler, it compiles our code, then happens some magic, and our code is magically executed with a full performance, we have this optimization, virtual machine, lazy, and so on. But in reality, after the compiler does its job, it outputs a bytecode which hits different paths inside the Java virtual machine. Your code can be uh, interpreted with, if it's not really hot. It can be uh, compiled, but with a different type of compilers. It can be C1 compiler, C2 compiler, and different variations of that uh, stuff. So usually, the higher the order of the compiler, the, the faster the code, usually, not always. And uh, the aggressive, the optimizations, the faster the code, but it requires more statistical information gathering from your code, so like warming up. Um, and there are pitfalls everywhere on the steps uh, that can uh, bite you, and you may even no not notice that. Uh, so for the pitfalls, uh, if you are doing uh, performance measuring by hand, uh, you should avoid a lot of different traps you should measure time correctly. If you use not the millisecond uh, time step, but nanosecond time step, why not? But the granularity of the nanosecond time step is not nanoseconds, it's much higher. Uh, so the code can be eliminated. And a lot of different 
tricks can be done. And if you're doing it manually, you're usually behaving like this guy. And uh, there are tools for that. And the main, the most famous tool for writing micro benchmark is GMH, is a Java micro benchmark harness. It's originally made for Java, but can be used with actually any language. There is a uh, SBT GMH plugin for Scala integration, and the integration looks like this. Uh, it's quite easy, only a single annotation. We just going to run it and see what, and see what happens. It takes some time to compile. Some magic happening. You remember the, the diagram? Uh, so we have uh, three warm up iterations. So it's warming up and actually measurement iterations. And we have some baseline performance. Our benchmark does nothing actually, but we have some numbers at least that are at the result of the measurement. Uh, later we will have some more uh, realist real world benchmark. Uh, if you, I'm not going to tell you a long story about how to measure correctly and incorrectly, but gave you links about the Alexei Shipilov is a performance engineer from OpenGDK about the general way to measure performance and different uh, ways of measuring performance in Java. Uh, the, the slides will be available on Twitter and everywhere, so there's hyperlinks here. And uh, the article, like measuring the time and the GMH code samples and see the documentation for the GMH. It's like the docs, but better with the code. Uh, and the first case, uh, case story is about pattern matching. Uh, pattern matching uh, is like a switch case, but on steroids and can do a lot of different things. But we will have some, uh, for the first mm, attempt of tasting the benchmarking, uh, we'll try to have a simple problem. We have a base trait and uh, three classes implementing this trait and the function which tries to understand which of the classes implement this trait. So quite simple, we have um, two implementations here, one with a pattern matching and one without the pattern matching with this imperative if then else style. Uh, the only one, what we will try to understand if there is a difference between this code uh, down to the machine level uh, for that. Uh, we run it through the GMH and see that for different uh, class types, like for buzz, the results are super close. But the question is that the results are close, but the machine code is close or not close. And uh, for that, we will go to the down to the rabbit hole. Um, the problem is that the machine code is the ultimate source of truth, but it takes some time and uh, to understand what's happening here. Uh, but we're on a Scalio conference, we're brave enough to read the machine code. So uh, what, how can we read the machine code emitted by the Java machine for Scala code? Uh, the, first, uh, the first way is just to enable this type of flag for the Java machine, print assembly, it will dump all the compiled method. The drawbacks of this is that it will dump all the compiled method for everything, even for the standard library of Scala, standard library of Java, and it will just millions of lines and it's hard to read and understand where is your code actually was. Uh, there are a hardware CPU performance counters uh, in the perf interface for Linux. We can also use that to understand what's happening with our code, but it's also too low level and doesn't help us to understand why our code is slow. But in the GMH uh, toolkit, there is a perfasm profiler which uh, combines both of these tools, but for humans, not for machines. It uh, tries to show exactly your code, uh, how it was compiled, and annotates with the different measurements from the uh, hardware performance counters. So for that, we are uh, going to run it. Uh, and to see, oh, something, someone decided to call me right now. Uh, running our bench, oh, sorry, I rebooted my laptop and it just And we're back. Uh, the problem is that uh, the default permissions for users do not allow reading the performance counters for everything. Uh, so now the warm up happens. Uh, and after the warm up, having some measurement and reading the assembly listing for that and annotating that. And we get a lot of stuff happening here. So blah, blah, blah. And the most uh, interesting part of the code is. Uh, 
Uh -huh. So with the increased font size, it's hard to understand where are we. Uh -huh. So that's our function here. And uh, there are different, uh, okay, anyway, I have uh, this picture for that, if no one understands. Uh, but if we uh, try to extract what was written there, but on a more readable way, the assembly listing for our function looks like this. So at the beginning, uh, so there are assembler operations. I don't, I, I'm not sure that you're used to reading assembly, but I will describe what's happening here. So at the beginning, we're reading the uh, reference for our some class, so for our input class. We, after that, we extract a class word for that. It's class word, it's like a class name, but it's a word, it's an integer uniquely identifying the class. And after that, we comparing this class word with other class words corresponding to other classes, like our foo. Uh, if it's equals to foo, we jump to this location, but uh, for our benchmark, we put buzz there as in the beginning. Uh, if it's equals to buzz, we're going to this location. If it's non equal to buzz, we go there. It's allowed default return value. And if it's and else, we're returning some value. So looks like perfectly understandable code. And what's inside our if else, if else, if else, uh, we're going here and I will just switch slides and you see that the assembly listing is exactly the same. The addresses are different and the registers are different, but it doesn't matter. So at least for uh, some cases, pattern matching can be the same as if then else, uh, but not for all of them. And to understand why can it be different, we're going to have some more sophisticated examples uh, with matching through options. Uh, we have some more sophisticated benchmarking setup. We have some uh, an input string, which is a option from string and just a string and two implementations with a matching and with a null check. So they're giving the same result at the end, uh, but uh, will they have the same performance? And if we run it through the JMH, we'll see that, aha, uh -huh, now here comes the difference. It's not that huge, but it's at least it's measurable. And null check is, for some reason, became a bit faster. Uh, for that, we'll try to understand why it's uh, became faster, because it just everything is optimized, the GVM is so smart, the Scala compiler is so smart, and we're so smart, but null check is faster. Uh, for that, we're going to the assembly listing of the null check, and uh, what we see here, so we again get the reference for our nullable string. Uh, we check the reference for zero in the, this strange way, but it's a change check for zero. If it's checked, if it's null, so we're going to this location, and otherwise we're returning the result. Uh, but inside our option pattern matching, uh, the things are uh, quite different. Uh, uh -huh. uh, at the beginning, we get our, again, the reference for our some string, but instead of comparing to null or not null, we uh, check the ex extract again the class word here and then compare it that it is sum. So we check, uh, it hints us that we did an instance of here. So we check that it's sum. After that, we extract the value field from the sum, check that it's string, and then return the result. So what's the difference here between the null check and the pattern matching? So for the null check, we had only a single branch. If the reference is zero, so we should return something. If we match by option, we have to do two checks, two branches. One is checking that it's option, and what the second one is checking that the there is a string inside this option. And uh, that happens because our option is a generic type and we cannot, on a GVM with this, uh, um, type erasure, yeah, I forgot the word. Uh, with a type erasure, it's impossible to check with a single branch that what's the generic type and what's inside the generic. So it has to do, and uh, we can have no escape with that. Uh, so, as a conclusion for our first simple test case is uh, that uh, pattern matching might have overhead, might have not overhead, but at least you now you know some tools to check uh, for your code and understand if there is a difference if you rewrite your code with the ugly one and the functional one. Um, and the overhead uh, is not that huge. Uh, the next case story is about tail recursion. Uh, it's hypnotizing, I know, I like it. Uh, and for the tail recursion, um, it's formally called the tail call optimization. 
and uh, the idea of this optimization is a compiler trick that transforms your tail uh, call recursion to a loop. Uh, it uh, is possible in Scala, it's possible only for the tail calls. There are other types of recursion, but they're not really possible to optimize on Scala compiler. That may be the case in future, but who knows? Uh, there is no native support on GVM for a tail call optimization, so all the optimizations are done on the compiler level. Uh, as a generic test case for tail recursion and trying to understand what's happening there are uh, Fibonacci numbers. Uh, so we have a sequence of numbers, and each next number is the sum of two previous numbers. So it, this one is uh, 1 plus 1, this one is 1 plus 2, and so on. So we have two implementations of our Fibonacci number computation. Uh, they are exactly the same, uh, but there is a only a, a small, tiny difference. So the first one is annotated with a tail rec. Its an annotation means that the Scala compiler uh, have two choices, either optimize it as a tail call recursion or just die. Uh, and it can do this only with the private or final methods. So for the second case, we just removed the private one, and it is not able to optimize it as a tail call. Uh, and uh, as a baseline, we can have just the same code, but written in a more imperative way with a while loop to understand uh, where is the difference and is there any difference with that. Uh, we run it with our GMH and see the results. So the first, there is a lot of numbers here, and the most interesting part is this one, the score. So for different uh, Fibonacci numbers, like 10s, 20th, and 40th, our um, loop is uh, quite close to our tail call optimized version, at least for the large Fibonacci numbers. For small Fibonacci numbers, there is a, um, the, our non-optimized version is uh, slower, it is expected actually, but the interesting part that tail recursion for 10th Fibonacci number is slower than tail recursion for 20th Fibonacci number. So uh, we do twice more work for the 20th number, but for some reason it became faster. So there are two strange things uh, there, and we're going to discuss them a bit. So for that, uh, we're th the first question is why our non-tail call optimized function is so slow. And for that, we're going uh, to read the bytecode. Enough for assembly for this case. Uh, the bytecode is more uh, readable than assembly uh, because it's much more high level. Uh, there is a Java P tool uh, for class file disassembly. It is even uh, embedded to Scala REPL. It's Java P. You can just easily decompile your class and see the bytecode for that. And uh, we're going to decompile our classes and see the difference. So for uh, our tail call optimized version, the uh, bytecode looks like this. I'm going to explain this strange letters here. So at the beginning, we load our first function argument. It's n. Uh, there, here comes our return from the tail call. If our n is 0, we just go at the end of the function, and here comes the return. Uh, if it's not the end of the recursion, we continue. We load our uh, first argument again. It's n. Uh, Java bytecode is a stack machine, so I will just write in the stack content, write it here. So we have n on a stack with load a constant 1. After that, we subtract and get the n minus 1 on a stack. Uh, the same happens with the b, a, b again, and a plus b. So we have the argument function calls here laying on a stack. But uh, you see that there is no function call here. There are three store instructions, and these three store instructions are overriding, overriding the uh, arguments of the function call. So we overrode our function call arguments, and then just going to the beginning of the function instead instead of the function call. Uh, so for the non-tail call optimized version, uh, the bytecode looks quite similar. So the we again load the n argument. There is our here comes our uh, return uh, from the recursion. Then uh, we get the zeroth argument of the function. It's for uh, class members. It's uh, this reference, reference to the class we're a member of. Then we have the exactly the same code, which is producing our arguments on a stack. And then here comes our invoke virtual operation. So we are invoking our function with these arguments, and it it loops until it returns. 
So it looks like the same, but the only difference uh, with the tail call optimized and non-tail call optimized is this virtual function call. But is there a huge, that huge difference? We always know that function calls are close to be free, but not on the GVM, because GVM is a kind of a more complex thing, because when you invoke a method in a GVM, it's not just directly jumping to straight to your code. Your code might be even not yet compiled. So it takes control from your code and resolves the method by name. It can compile, recompile, decompile, de-optimize, and do a lot of different things with your method. It looks at the address of this method, creates a stock frames, passes arguments. All of these steps can be optimized, but they're um, not can be optimized just to a single instruction like an a go to. So uh, our assembly listing for our function call looks like this. So note the address. The address is here at the beginning of the function, and here comes the call. But the address of the call is not matching our function, so we're jumping straight into the GVM to give it control, and it may do some other things like here. So comparing uh, two instructions, our go to and invoke virtual, we understand that go to uh, is just an unconditional jump. It's uh, blazingly fast. It's single CPU instruction. And for uh, invoke virtual, it uh, invokes a lot of different overhead for virtual machine. In theory, hotspot can optimize it without taking a control, but only for some specific cases and the tail call Recursion with the Fibonacci numbers is not that case which it can be can optimize without taking the control from your code. Uh, the second question, the more uh, mystical one, why the Fibonacci number for the tenth number is uh, slower than for the twentieth number? So twentieth number is just much more complex, it's much more computations being done. But for that, we're not going just to stick to ten and twenty. Let's just compute it for eleven, for twelve, and write a graph for that, and. What we see here, so the complexity and performance is grow growing, 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 and then something happens after the 16th Fibonacci number, and we have some huge spike in performance. It became like two and uh, something uh, parts uh, times faster. What's been happening between the 16th and 17th number? And for that, we are going to uh, to run our I'm going to reduce the font because it's hard to understand what's happening here. Uh, okay, we're running our benchmark for the 16th Fibonacci uh, number. We have to wait a bit. Uh, there are only five warm up iterations, so five measurement iterations. Uh, of waiting, takes patience, and, okay, so it's not that, uh, that wasted. So, okay, our function is here, and what we see here is a kind of a tight loop here. We hear our, the, the, the subtraction, the addition, we're like looping and computing Fibonacci numbers in a loop, nothing unusual here, just a normal loop. I won't go into explain it in a much detail, because we're going to see some strange and weird things when we go on the 17th iteration. It again takes patience. Performance measuring takes patience usually because uh, it's only five warm-up iterations, but to get a reliable result you need some much more iterations. And uh, JMH can do a multiple of ports of GVM because it can optimize the same function in a different way on a different runs. Okay, so we're going to our function and what it is. So we hear this an interesting pattern here. I can, it's like a, I'd like to move it, move it. So we don't understand what's happening here, but if we count the, the number of the strange patterns, like add, move, add, move, add, move, it is exactly 16. So, and <coughs> what happened here? Yes, definitely. There happened a loop unrolling. So instead of our, uh, if our tail recursion in a loop is a loop, uh, Hotspot decided to unroll it in a different way. So if we have more than 16 numbers to compute, we just have them in a straight line, computed in a row, 16 at once. And then we're calling our function. It's a kind of a pseudocode for that. It's not a tail call optimized version. Uh, but, and we subtract 16 from the n at the end. 
or if it's less than 16, we just go our regular path. So that's why it became much faster because of the uh, loop and rolling. Uh, but we, uh, it's hard to explain why Hotspot decided to unroll exactly 16, but not eight operations at once. It's kind of a mystery. Uh, there are some answers for that, but I have no time to explain it. Uh, so as for conclusion uh, for the recursion, so on most cases, uh, tail call optimization is equals to loop. There are some cases that it is not equals, um, but um, tail call is cool. I like to use it. It stops, let, let you uh, stop thinking with loops when you're transitioning from other imperative languages to Scala. Um, and uh, it's hard to start uh, using it in real life, uh, not just computing Fibonacci numbers, but it uh, boosts your code readability after you get used to it. If you want more uh, reading about recursion, there is an interesting talk by Alexei Shipilov. It's called Scala versus Java divided with fail. It's also about tail call optimization, but in a case when the tail call optimization failed. So there was an optimization, but the performance was much worse, but with an optimization. Um, if you want to know how the methods are called on the GVM, there is also an article that nobody can read until the end called the Black Magic of Java Method Dispatch and the internals of the hotspot. Uh, also interesting read to understand why, how the things are behaving under the hood. Uh, and the third and more most interesting test case are Scala collections. Um, for people switching from other languages, uh, Scala collections are like uh, being in heaven, so it's an easy way to do uh, complex things. Uh, but you know, all the cool things cannot be always free. There is some uh, overhead consumed, but we don't know which, what overhead. So we're going to measure it. But there is a lot of different collections inside the Scala collection API, so we cannot measure everything. But at least we can have some simple case and to test it on a different implementations of collection and see what's under the hood and how which tools can we use to explain what's happening under the hood. And you can uh, reproduce all these benchmarks later at your home with other collections and trying to understand how do they behave down to the rabbit hole to the your CPU. Uh, so the problem is uh, a simple one. We have a sequence of numbers and we're going to get the sum of their squares. So for one to three, we we'll get 14 at the end. So quite simple one. Uh, and we can have a, like a baseline implementation without all these collections and just on a pure imperative way, uh, we have a loop, a counter, we just multiply, add and so on, nothing, not, nothing special here, and a single, simple functional way implementation with fold, so we just iterate through our collection and to increase our counter with the square of the element. So they produce the same result at the, at the end, but uh, for the performance, uh, before I show you the results, we're going to have a short quiz. Uh, so the first, uh, so is it faster or slower and what's the difference in the performance? So our fault performance is, so the first variant is just for realists. It's the same as loop, the same result, the same iterations, it should be the same. The second variant is for optimists, it's faster than loop because it's Scala compiler, Java virtual machine, it can do a lot of interesting things under the hood we don't know yet. The same the third for pessimists is two times slower, and the third one is like a fill the gap with some crazy uh, variant here. So let's just vote. Who thinks that it's the same? You can raise your hand. Okay. Uh, there are some realists here. Optimists, the second one. Oh, cool. Maybe pessimists, it's two times slower than loop. Uh huh. Okay. And someone who thinks that it's seven times slower. Uh huh. The interesting thing that uh, and the results are looking like this one. So our fault became much slower, but but why? We're trying to understand uh, why. But uh, at the beginning, we're benchmarking apples and oranges. So here comes the array and here comes the list. So we cannot just compare these things because they're implemented in a different way. So they will be different performance measurements there. Uh, and so trying to see the real difference, how the hardware sees your code. We're going to read the hardware performance counters from our benchmark and see what happens down to your CPU. And running it um, 
for our loop that produces a lot of different numbers, but the most two interesting ones are, are highlighted by the gray one. It's the number of branches. It's quite a large number, but anyway, uh, and uh, last level cache loads. It's the number of loads from the main memory to your uh, L3 CPU cache. There is not that much of them. And it's for the loop, and for our list performance, we see that we have like seven times more branches there, and, uh, and much more uh, last level cache loads. So we have a huge uh, memory to CPU traffic when we're using lists. And that's happening because actually lists and array are different, are differently implemented. So list is a linked list. We have a pointer to the next node and to iterate we need to check if the there, is no there is a next node. Here comes our branching. If we're go going to get a value, we're going to, we have a reference to a value so laying somewhere on a heap. So the here comes our memory traffic because these values are distributed randomly on our heap. So, and for array, everything is much more simpler. No boxing, no references, just strain values in line. So they can, uh, can fit your CPU cache perfectly and that's why there is a difference. Okay, so to optimize that, we're just going to use fold left on an array. So we're not going to use list. It should become faster. We know it's array and this is a list. There should be many branching here. So on, and uh, we're running our benchmark. And uh, there is a picture for that. Like our uh, uh, array folding became even slower than it was for a list. <laughs> uh, and trying to, we're trying to understand why it's happening. It's not just the generic advice, don't use fold array on arrays. Um, um, for that, we're going to use another tool from the GMH. It's called a garbage collector profiler. It's a simple, super simple uh, GC profiler which reads uh, GMX from time to time and just show you average measure measurements about how much garbage are you producing in your application. So for our fold array, we see that we are producing like uh, one and a half gigabytes of garbage per second computing this sum of squares. So you might assume that it's quite a lot. We're just iterating through an array. Why are we producing so much garbage here? And uh, for that, we're trying going, uh, seeing our code. And we're again comparing apples and oranges. Um, because this counter is a primitive here. Because it's just a long, no need to box and box that. And here, uh, the count, the, the Despite of that, it's written as long. It's a box long, and Scala collections are generic. They have generic interface, and uh, we're creating a new long object on each iteration, iteration, and then disposing this object again and again. And for a large arrays, it is just a completely crazy and going to a couple of gigabytes of garbage per second. So uh, Scala collections are generic. They're uh, definition of the fold left looks like this. So this A and B are cannot be primitive. They, in theory, they can, but for not for the Scala collections, because there is a technique on, uh, there is an annotation in Scala called specialized. It's a way to uh, make a copy of your method or class, uh, but with the primitive types injected instead of your generic type. But it will blot your code multiple times. So if you are going to specialize Scala collections, which are a couple of megabytes for four generic, four simple primitive types, it will become four times larger. So that's why it's not done for Scala collections. Um, there are some alternative collections implementations which are specialized, but there are not a Scala collections. So just some external libraries. Uh, in some maybe Java 10, there is a project Valhalla which allow using primitives inside of a generics, but it is in an early stages and I don't know when we are going to see. So for the current moment, there is no real escape from boxing and boxing in Scala collections if you are using it with the primitive types. But uh, Martin Andersky on the keynote told that it's 2.12 time. There is a new optimizer there that can do a lot of different things. It can treat lambdas in a more native way to the GVM. And we're using lambdas in the fold left, so it should be maybe faster. So let's just run our benchmark here and see the result that it is uh, again slower. So what's happening here? We're trying to understand why it became 
again slower and slower from our baseline we're just moving to the infinite times and that so uh, for that we're going to see what is going to be uh, fed into the bytecode generating backend there is a, a flag for Scala compiler called print it um, so the Scala compiler transforms your code from the real code to abstract syntax tree then it transforms it in a different ways and then the final syntax tree which is fed to the bytecode generator backend can be just dumped again as a kind of a Scala code it's mostly a Scala pseudocode it won't compile with a Scala compiler but it reads like a Scala code so we're going to dump it for uh, 2.11 and see what's been rewritten for our folder array one liner so there is much more code happening here at the beginning, we see that there, there is a wrapper in array ops, which wrapping our array, where, where this full left method is defined. And here we're creating a new class. It's a synthetic class which uh, is generated for each lambda. And there is a method which does this addition and multiplication, but it's not called directly. It's called by the wrapper and generic wrapper with this object and object which is boxed and boxed, so we see our garbage generated here. A lot of garbage. We didn't sell it in our one-liner code, but for this code, we see it. It's just here. Okay, let's just see what is generated for the 2.12. Okay, it's much more shorter, at least. So the same interay ops, the same uh, function, but here we're calling our... There is no uh, class wrapper for our lambda. It's just a method. And it looks like that we're just calling this method as it is without any wrappers and so on. So where is our boxing and boxing and why the hell it is became slower? Um, but uh, there is a different behavior of lambdas in 2.11, 2.12. So in 2.11, this is kind of an old times for the Java when there was no lambdas in Java. And we are generating a function n wrapper for all the uh, lambdas and we link this class to the method of the m m place of invocation of lambda on compile time it's just a virtual call of other class nothing fancy here for uh, 2.12 it became a bit more sophisticated so lambda is compiled not as a class as a method uh, there is a runtime linking between your invocation of lambda and uh, the lambda code itself and it's happening through the invoke dynamic operation, the same as in Java 8, and using this J function and functional interface. So this interface is being uh, generated on runtime, and if we open the code of this interface, uh, we see that it looks like our old wrapper, which has boxing, unboxing, and that's all. So here comes the boxing again, he cross, him, here comes the garbage. But the problem is that it doesn't explain the difference between the 2.11 and 2.12. Okay, it's gener generating a different code, but it should be faster. Why it's not faster? And for that, we just look, have a look at on the slowest methods for uh, our 2.11 code. So we see that all our fold array methods and lambdas and uh, generated classes were perfectly in line in a huge machine code uh, function which runs on our CPU it's taking like 98% of all the time and if we see our hottest method for 2.12 uh, it's not that good uh, because uh, it was not in line we have function calls between them and uh, it was not in line it's uh, hard to tell why it's what's not in line but the usual answer of the failure of inlining that the size of the method is bigger and there is a hard limit for inlining in Java virtual machine. It cannot inline, by default, it cannot inline huge methods. It just decides to do a function call. So you can uh, change this behavior by different uh, GVM flags. It can inline, but by default it does not. And th here comes the function calls. Here comes our difference. So for the uh, 2.12, uh, it is much more native to Java 8, Java Virtual Machine version 8, but um, there comes a lot of more optimizations for dynamic linking for lambdas and static linking, so it's not yet uh, able to optimize your code in a way as it can do with, a, with an old times, because it's kind of a new technology, only four or five years for the invoke dynamic. So uh, 
for uh, if you're using Scala collections with the uh, primitives, so be aware of boxing. It can bite you, even if you decide just to use an array instead of uh, all the Scala collections and see that it's array, there is no boxing there. And it can cause boxing because there is an array ops wrapper with all this function, functional collection style uh, happening. Um, uh, there are multiple of implementations of other uh, alternative collections. It's first one is the box, uh, the first, third, third, second one is ABC. They're doing the same things. Uh, they're having the same close API to the Scala collections, but uh, they're not directly implementing the API of Scala collections. They taste the same, but a different API. And this API is specialized for the main uh, primitive types. So there will be no boxing, and the performance is usually the same as it's uh, with a while loop. Uh, so as a conclusion, um, I cannot give you a direct uh, answer, which is Scala code is slow or not, and I cannot give you a direct advice of uh, just use Scala collections and don't use Scala collections. It usually depends. So at least now you know that there are tools for you to understand how your code behaves down to the rabbit hole and how it is being executed by the CPU. And you can just go home and uh, try to test your code and understand what's happening in your hotspots and how, how can it be optimized. And usually, for my code, it can be easily optimized like in four times, five times, seven times, just for um, simple, simple variations of the code. Um, so for the Scala, it's quite easy to write a code which is, will be slow, but super beautiful. Um, if you're using primitives here, it will be even slower and even more beautiful. Um, and uh, GVM is not that uh, got used to the Scala emitted bytecode. But uh, the situation is slowly changing, so um, if you are knowing how your code is being, the, the full pipeline of your code from the keyboard to the CPU, you can write a code which will be beautiful, functional, immutable, with ponies and rainbows, and it will be fast. Uh, and uh, 2.12 is coming in the following months, or weeks, or years, and it's much more GVM friendly, but not always. Uh, so. Uh, all the benchmarks are on GitHub. You can clone them and just run. There are much more benchmarks there than I've uh, described on the talk, but there are most interesting ones. Uh, slides are here. Will be available after the conference, after the, my talk, maybe in 10 or 15 minutes. You can follow me on Twitter if you can read Russian. Uh, you can drop me an email. So um, that's all. You can ask me questions if you're not. If your head is not going to burst after the assembly listing. No question. Ah, well, finally. kind of a latest success stories which happened maybe a week ago in my work. We do search for e-commerce, so search can be some, somehow related to the performance when it comes to the latency of the search. So we had some search function which is applied inside Elasticsearch to different documents to score them. And it was written just for some business requirements without any thinking about performance. And for some merchants, it took like uh, up to 300 milliseconds to score all the documents. And after we fixed it in uh, using all the tools from this uh, from this talk, it became like five times faster. But it was really a small rewrite, just a small changes here and there. But uh, understanding why we're making the changes, and these are were made maybe for two hours of just seeing the bytecode, seeing the assembly listing, and just fixing it in a way should so it should be more optimal without boxing and boxing and so on. So it can be quite. Uh, quite high. And there is a call, call kind of an omda allow. So uh, for all of your applications, there is only a small part of this application which is really uh, 
important from from the perform performance point of view, and uh, you can optimize it just a bit, but it will have a great impact of the overall application performance. So these are quite useful, not maybe for the databases if you are not writing the database, but if you are, uh, these these advices are also quite important. But there is a general advice not to write your own database. Not really. So I know that there, are, uh, there, are, there are. There is even a, on this um, uh, on this GitHub. There is even a benchmark for this alternative collections. But I'm not using them. So because uh, it's maybe more representative for me to <laughs> write a while loop in a single place when it's really important. But if you like a functional approach, you can just plug it, and they have the same API. because for streams for primitives in Java 8 there are some specialized versions of str in stream and so on so in general they will be faster than Scala collections because Scala collections are not optimized for that so yes there will be a difference and Java 8 streams for primitives will be faster without any external collections but uh, for the because of this uh, specifically implemented classes for streams of integers of doubles of floats and so on it's like a manual specialization. Uh, you know, the profiler, yes, uh, uh, personally, I use profiler for some time, but uh, profiler show you that uh, your code, so show you where your code is slow, but it won't show you why is it slow. So just this function is slow. What should you do with that? But if you're trying to go deep with a bytecode, and with the uh, assembly listings, you can understand not only where is it slow, but also why is it slow, and what can you do with that. So these tools are giving you more answers. They're not that useful for understanding where is it slow and how the distributions of the performance between your methods are. That's the use case for profiler. But uh, most of the profilers, like uh, JProfiler or your kit, they're not showing you the assembly listings and so on, and they're not going to give you these types of answers. Hmm? Uh, in real life, I think that it's mostly a question not of a beautiful code, but of uh, ability to support this code, of management code, and usually the beautiful code is uh, close to being much more easily managed. But uh, as for the AMDAL low, like 95% of your code may be not even called or called once, so there is no purpose to optimize it this at all. But for only some small parts which are important and the hotspots, maybe just a couple of functions for all your applications, it is might be more important to rewrite them in a more ugly way, but it will gain you a lot of impact if it's really needed for your business because it's no need to optimize just for the sake of optimizing. Mm. For a big application, I think the first step will be a profiler, just trying to get rid of most of the code which is not relevant for performance. And you see that there are some hotspots, at least a couple of functions, and you have some look on these functions. Maybe even without profiler, just trying to understand what's happening here. It's you just staring at your code and uh, rubber duck performance debugging doesn't help. You can use these tools. So I guess that's the time. Yes. So if there's, there are no more answers, Thank you for your patience and attention.